everyone, and welcome to the history lessons in the Dupedia world. Today, we're going to continue on the topic of how was life before agriculture, when society, when the groups of humans were hunter-gatherers. What we're going to be briefly talking about today, because it's really a big subject and we're only going to see just a couple of and uh, we'll get a bit of insight, a couple of things, but not really deepen into this that uh, we're talking about today, that is the technology, the development of tools in that moment. We have the concept that technology is something very modern, but and that could not be associated with prehistoric times and uh, pre agriculture, but it is. They did have tools. Let's just remember that hunter-gatherers would keep this method for more than 718,000 years from the first hominids to Homo sapiens. We put them all together. We know that they foraged for fruits, wild plants, fish, meat, and they little by little developed these specific tools. Also, let's uh, remember that things like fire would later improve tool making to strengthen wooden lances and everything. So we have this idea that little by little they started evolving. And it's precisely this characteristic, the creation of tools, that gives us quite a chronology on the development of intelligence. We have to say that um, this has been also widely conserved and historians use it as a fossil that will help us date and uh, identify the different periods. Normally, they always used natural materials that you had around. The, the hypothesis is that they might have used nets, for example, but we cannot prove that without evidence. So the tools that we'll be finding are basically wood and organic materials would have been used for sure, but it's extremely rare. There are exceptions, uh, sometimes when wood has been covered by mud, ash or water, but it's terribly rare. They are pre-Neolithic villages, for example in Spain, that have been found that because of the wood and the ash in the ground, but basically nothing organic has obviously reached our days. We'll be, what we'll be talking about today is basically stone and maybe some bone. And we have to say, these materials are extremely important. Not only because of the properties of the material, but because of the areas that you can find this material. Okay, The first will be cobblestones that you can find near a river. These are widely spread, but you have to go to the areas where you can find them. So people actually started using these tools and they went to find the materials, the raw materials, expressively with the intention. It's not just that they found it lying around. They traveled for this. For example, flintstone in the next phases, in the more mid-upper Paleolithic, this flintstone will be widely used. But we have to say that these kind of stones you can only find in very specific places. So that will give us the information on how far they would have to move to acquire this or 
that there was probably actually some trade between groups exchanging material, probably raw material and then perfected material and tools or meat, we don't know. But these stones, this raw material was really difficult to find. We have flintstone for instance, quartz, various types of of stones and rocks and minerals that will be chosen specifically for certain type of tools. This will be an indicator on how this technology was evolving. We'll start with the most simple one in the lower Paleolithic. We'll have three type of traditions uh, that are just the start of all this. The very first stone tools were probably, obviously, broken, sharp edged rocks that they found casually used and then discarded. But this was the start of it. You see it, you find a use, and then you go, um, I could actually create one of these by chipping off the stone. So they will eventually start making their own sharp edge stone tools and this has been called pebble tool tradition because obviously it entails sharpening pebbles, small and larger, to remove especially some flakes also that then they will also use. Here you use everything. I swear, you use everything. The little sharp pieces that come out of chopping and uh, hitting these, uh, these pebbles, they will also be used as knives. The next one is a chopper chopping tool tradition. And the primary goal for this was use the cores also, and they're very heavy. These tools will not be only used to chop, but to break nuts, to break bones, to uh, try and take out the meat from bones, to just get some grains into dustier way uh, in a dusty material that they could transport easier. They, they had a great variety. You can imagine all the things you could do with this. But the, it was basically to work through their, their meat, their nutrition, their fruits, their nuts, everything that could be a bit more difficult to access, they would use as stones. The next innovation in this most basic tools is the hand axe. This is the progressive uh, refinement of this technology. We'll see that they have more cutting edges, raw material, and it does come as obvious when comparing these two traditions to this one, is that you increasingly have some more efficiency and you are trying to find other ways in how you can use the same tools. This hand axe, obviously it was used as defensive, but you could use also to cut easier and you could use both sides. So if one side started not being perfect to use, losing its sharpness, then you could use the next one. So this is the basic tools in this first period and the, uh, these have a great variety and have been found all over Europe and the Middle East. Let's go to next. I am saying that we're going really quickly through this um, stone technology, stone age technology, because it's really complex. You can go into a lot of detail. We'll just quickly 
square thread. So we're putting middle and upper Paleolithic together. How do we see the difference here? Well, now compared to the really simple tools that we had before, we have an increased specialization of these tools. You'll have different uh, tools for different works. You didn't use just one for everything. You'll use different little ones, larger ones for really specific works. The materials will vary. Before we say we had cobblestones, here is when the flintstones, the cores, what we're talking about comes in. They start using different materials to adapt the tools to the needs. And on the top of this, we'll have different techniques to create these tools. We can see how different they come. We see uh, that they've been taking advantage of sharp edges, they'll be using more flakes, they'll start modify them for the specific tasks. And especially the cores of the material they'll use exhaustively. They're not going to leave anything without being useful. We see they yeah, have scrapers, double scrapers, these were used to work also the skins of the animals. So you had things so specific like this. Then look at these little ones. They had knives, scrapers, burins, to, for really fine jobs, even that. So with the flints that will, they'll take out, they'll do all this literal micro lithic that we call micro stone tools. You had more level point, uh, point that we'll talk about, double scrapers. You see there's so many. And the techniques. Well, you'll see that these techniques um, let them have larger pieces of material that then they would work through and smaller pieces that then they could use for this really uh, more specific and delicate tasks. We have first the Levallois technique. It comes from the core of the stone. We take a large cobblestone and then we hit it until it flakes around its perimeter. On the one side, uh, the percussion, you flake it until it looks like a tortoise shell and then you hit on the top so you get flakes from the other side. The, normally the first um, edges of the couple are trimmed into this rough shape and then you remove its, its cortex. This detached flake we'll use for other tools and then we'll just continue. We can see that the, one of the big advantages of this technique is that with one raw material you can produce lots of tools. And let's see that the final shape of this tool closely corresponds with the initial shape of the core and that's why you had to wedge the edges. With care, we see that a number of flakes could be removed also from one core, producing more usable cutting edges with less waste. You really didn't want waste here because this material was dearly important. You did not have much. We also have the disc core technique. It's not too different from the, the Libalwa technique. But the technology still depends on carefully shaping the core and then you can remove the ready-to-use flakes for this tool. You just really work on shaping the core and then when you hit it, you get out these flakes that are already really close to what you need. You need a skill to prepare this course. So we believe that it wasn't just anyone 
that you actually had to learn these skills. Stay for a while with the person who already knew and work and work. So here we start having also the transfer of knowledge and technology. More close to the upper Paleolithic, we have another technique. This one will be even better to avoid having too much waste. It's a prismatic blade technology, it's called. This improved drastically the amount of sharp tools that you could get out of one core. What you basically use is hitting the stone, making a flat surface at the top and then really hitting on the edges so one large part of the stone would come up and you would already have a knife shaped part, a knife shaped tool. With these it was really easy to modify them and convert them into blades and burdens that then opened, opened a whole new world to use wood and bone working that we'll see later on. We're talking now about burins, burin blades in the upper Paleolithic that, we're talk that we are now. These are just becoming more refined and refined. We see that uh, they had to modif they started modifying these already great flakes and they would use them to gouge bones, antlers and as you can see they would not only use it to break it but to modify them. For instance here we have some harpoons made of bone. Uh, imagine that would help so much with fishing uh, because or just with spears, with hunting and fishing because you see they modified it so this harpoon would go in easily but if you see the little points coming out it goes in one direction but then it makes it really difficult to pull out so the animal would not quickly escape and if it did it would be fatally wounded fatally wounded sorry because if it was well put this wound would keep on being open. You could not pull this out easily. You needed another human to pull that out and that was not easy for the animals. Also, there would be another innovation with modifying bones. Look at this, needles. This is very basic, but with needles now you could use it to stick together two pieces of fur, two pieces of some skin of some animal and this way you would have something warmer that would not fall off constantly in winter and cold time. It was really basic, really rustic, you would use plant-based ropes, it was really thick obviously at the start at least and little by little it gets better. Not, also, not only you can use that to make clothing but to make more complicated and complex nets. We think or we believe they use nets. We don't have the nets to prove it but we have the tools to actually create them. And this is just a quick overview as I said on the different tools that we found from this period and the theories we have on how these tools were used. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and see you in the next one.